Hi guys, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of The Walking Dead Season 8, Episode 9, the mid-season premiere titled Honor. And guys, welcome back to New Rockstar's Breakdown of The Walking Dead, where I take a closer look at each episode to explain any lingering mysteries and point out some of the things that you might have missed. Now, of course, it's hard to focus on the details after an episode that was such a gut punch. No, not Carl's death. Morgan literally punching a dude in the gut and ripping out said guts. Kalima style. Dude, just leave something for the walkers, right? Barf. I'm gonna get to Morgan's psycho killer turn later, along with the impact of Carl's death on the world of the show. But first, let us start with the big question. Brought to us on Twitter by Yoji. The flashback at the end with Judith is mind-blowing. Is that gonna happen? And while we're talking about these closing shots, there was also this tweet from Alex asking about that final, final shot of Rick laying on the ground bleeding, you know, the one next to the tree with the stained glass hanging from the branches. Yes, these two closing shots are both very intriguing, so let's talk about them. First, we see the final part of the old man Rick future vision with future Judith skipping up and saying hello to, of all people, Negan? Holy crap! <laughs> yeah, in case you missed this, it was revealed this episode that of all these warm, fuzzy visions of the future that uh, we've been seeing all season were really Coral's fantasy scenario. A uh, happy ending he just dreamt up. Unfortunately, one that will never happen. <laughs> At least, uh, not like this. Not like this. Remember, in episode one, Carl only appeared briefly in passing, making a joke about the music in those visions. That The bulk of that vision instead focuses on Rick and Judith and the other happy residents of fantasy Alexandria. That's because Carl knew he would never be part of that uh, dream scenario, or at least he wouldn't be the star of it. Instead, Carl just hopes for a future where Judith listens to the music he liked, and Rick is so merciful in this war that he figures out how to live with Negan as a peaceful, functioning member of this society. Now, again, we're still meant to look at this imagery as a fantasy extreme, a work of Carl's imagination. In reality, Alexandria just got bombed, guys. Jerry and Eugene aren't necessarily safe, and Negan, while arguably capable of peace, probably isn't gonna turn into old McDonald farming tomatoes. So while it's interesting to see the future Carl had in mind, there are still lots of different ways this could go. Which brings us to the final, final, final shot of the episode. This also gives us more context to imagery that we saw back in episode one with Rick's sad eyes looking up at the stained glass. Here, a wider shot shows us that Rick is actually wounded and bleeding. Curiously, it's in the same region of the body as where Carl was bitten, though I don't think this was a bite wound. I think what we're seeing here is some vision of actual future events, with Rick in the midst of battle, perhaps post-battle, and the location of his injury on his lower right might be leading him to recall his son's final moments. As for what could have caused this injury, I'm gonna bring up something from the comics, so if you don't read The Walking Dead comics and you don't wanna get spoiled, skip to this time. Got it? See, I'm, I'm giving you a chance to save yourself, so don't be a dope and complain in the comments that I, I ruined anything for you. Go on, skip. Okay, as you comic readers know, in the final days of the Savior War, Negan orders his men to slather their weapons in walker guts so that when they wound Rick's people, they infect them. This clever move causes a scare when Dwight, still pretending to be on Negan's side, shoots Rick in the gut with an arrow. Luckily, we find out that the arrow was clean and Rick survives to Negan's surprise. This leads to a final confrontation with Negan. The two bark at each other, their philosophies. Rick cuts Negan's throat just a little bit. Negan breaks Rick's leg and Rick pronounces the war over as he orders Negan to be treated and imprisoned. So perhaps what we're seeing here is Rick suffering from a similar wound. Now I don't see any arrow in this shot, that's his revolver at his side there, but maybe Rick is just wounded, close to death, leading to this mercy prevailing over his wrath and decision to end the war with Negan in custody, not executed. Now if you listen closely here, Rick does say the line, my mercy prevails over my wrath. This is a callback to the season eight premiere. Sadiq spoke this line and it was echoed by Carl to Rick. Now, Carl has been urging his father to adopt a more merciful, forgiving worldview that challenges them to rise above their vengeful wrath. Rick whispering the phrase here suggests that worldview might actually influence his actions in the near future, at least when it comes to Negan. Let's actually run through the other connections to past episodes in our segment, Callbacks. 
Seeing this, uh, this was Carl's goodbye episode, we got to walk down memory lane for his character with lots of nods to past moments, all major life moments for him. First, there was his fatal blow with a replay of that moment back in episode six when old Chompers got a piece of him. This time, the camera stays in close on Carl's reaction, showing us his full thought process as reality sets in on him. Later on with Judith, Carl tells his sister, sometimes we gotta show our parents the way. This is also a callback to that uh, episode six episode. It's a direct quote from a line that he said to Sadiq when they both talked about their parents. He also passes on his iconic hat to Judith. He mentions how it used to belong to Rick. He gave it to his son in season one and Carl wore it to feel strong like his dad is. Maybe giving Judith this hat could end up being a passing of the torch moment, like a future teenage Judith could end up playing the function young adult Carl plays in the comics. Carl also references his time at the prison in his uh, final moments. He talks about his mother's death, something this moment with Carl is definitely intended to parallel. He quotes her final words when she said that he was going to beat this world, and now he passes on that promise to Judith. He also references the kid that he shot shortly after that, the one who was surrendering, but Carl shot him anyway. Remember, that was uh, Jody, the boy from Woodbury. Carl brings him up as an example of his merciful attitude that he now wants Rick to embrace. He says that ruthless violence is just too easy to fall into in this world, so it's important to rise above it. Carl discusses this while the episode intercuts with this debate between Morgan and Carol and Ezekiel over what to do about Gavin. Morgan's ethical dilemma is the practical example of the hypothetical Carl is talking about there. So it's thematically appropriate that the one to kill the surrendered man is, once again, a boy, Henry, following in Carl's prior footsteps here. Henry represents the danger of this easy violence that Carl is warning us about. Actually, notice how the final shot of Gavin is a direct, centered, frontward facing close up. I think those are meant to evoke the iconic shots of Rick's people during Negan's infamous Lucille lineup. This framing seems to be The Walking Dead's way of hinting at a condemned figure the moment before their execution. Let's actually look closely at a few other subtle, interesting visual choices made throughout this episode in our segment <gasps> Zoom and Enhance. So, in addition to the intercutting with Carl and Morgan, you may have noticed how earlier Carl's description of his happy ending future intercuts with these images of Rick and Michonne tearfully digging a grave. On a metaphorical level, this editing choice suggests that Carl's naively hopeful dreams might be getting buried along with him. Also notice how Carl's face gets coated in dust from the bombing overhead. This is an interesting effect on his skin tone during these scenes, making him appear even more pale and lifeless, kind of like a corpse collecting dust. It's almost like Carl is slowly transitioning to a walker before our eyes as he makes his goodbyes, giving all of his words more of a ghostly, beyond the grave weight. But some of the most interesting visual choices this episode involved how Morgan was shot. There was this one menacing shot of him walking up the theater aisle, trailing the injured Gavin as he tried to escape. Also, there were three separate shots that showed Saviors escaping, disappearing from frame, but as we expected the camera to cut away, the camera is left rolling, showing what seems like a few seconds of nothing important, but then, whoa, uh -oh, Morgan slowly enters the frame like a real creeper. These extra seconds of the camera left rolling build suspense within us, setting up Morgan as kind of a jump scare. This cinematography, along with the concerned reaction shots from Carol and Ezekiel, paint Morgan as a frightening, villainous figure this whole episode. This technique is actually something we've seen in other well-known horror films, so let's move on to the other possible cultural influences in this episode in our segment, Under the Influence. Yeah, I hope you like these segment titles as much as I do. Okay, this letting the camera roll move has been used in a lot of horror cinema. Recently in Paranormal Activity, the home video is left recording on a static shot endlessly, building tension until a shadow moving or furniture or a ghostly presence just slides in the frame. This effect is uh, similar with Morgan here. He's not heroic, he's scary. The guy's gonna stand over you while you sleep for hours and hours. Also notice Morgan's slow, deliberate movement. He chases after Gavin with a sense of inevitability like Michael Myers from Halloween or the Terminator. There's no mercy here, Morgan is a killing machine. While we're talking about cultural influences here, notice the tension of the characters as they're in that sewer tunnel underneath Alexandra as it gets bombed. The steady booms and rumbles begins to undo some of them mentally. This could be influenced by a moment in history when British civilians in London had to go underground to wait out German blitzkriegs. 
Those unnerving overhead booms became a regular part of life for, in wartime London for all those people. And a lot of you guys were asking about the song that plays during Carl's final day montage. This is At the Bottom of Everything by Bright Eyes. It did at first seem a little odd to hear this happy sounding guitar tune over these sad moments, but if you listen closely to these lyrics, it's all about embracing the end during a plane crash. And that's exactly what Carl's doing here, making the most of his final day, hanging out with Judith, feeling the sun on his face, writing goodbye letters to Rick, Michonne, Enid, dozen other secret crushes he apparently had. But let's move on to the deeper meaning of this episode. Again, this episode was called Honor, and for me, Honor seems to refer to the way Carl wants Rick to fight this war with Negan. It doesn't have to be a kill or be killed, winner take all philosophy. For Carl, the more honorable approach would be for his dad to let his mercy prevail over his wrath. In the real world test case that we see of this dilemma, with Morgan debating with Carol and Ezekiel over whether to execute Gavin, it's interesting that, for a second at least, Morgan almost seems like he might let his mercy prevail too. A violent psycho killer rediscovering his humanity. This gives us hope that Carl's worldview might actually succeed in the final days of this war. Unfortunately, Henry going through with this execution reminds us that actions have consequences, and the violence of our choices might, as it almost did with Carl, inspire the darkest behavior in the younger generation. Hopefully, Carl's death will have more of an inspirational effect on these survivors, with torchbearers like Sadiq and Judith left behind to carry his legacy and his message for troubled kids like Henry to hopefully hear it. And let's check in on our kill count this episode. Guys, how could it be anyone else? Morgan, who by my count took down at least eight saviors this episode, one of them gutting them like a fish. Morgan is quickly approaching Daryl to become the deadliest character on The Walking Dead when it comes to on-screen kills. And to think, this whole bloody revenge journey began with Tabitha the Goat. A question for you guys, which character death do you think will have a bigger impact on Rick? Carl's death or his wife Lori's death? Comment down below to let me know your thoughts on this and on this whole mid-season premiere in general. Or tweet me directly at EA Voss and follow New Rockstars on Twitter for updates on our videos. Like this video and subscribe to New Rockstars for a deep, obsessive analysis of The Walking Dead. And make sure to follow all of my uh, breakdowns from the past episodes of this season for all the other stuff that you might have missed. And if you really want to help out this channel and help us grow, you can contribute any small amount you feel like to us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our donors, especially Kelly Hopper. Guys, thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye.